You're listening to the Fan of Fan Podcast, and on this episode, we're talking about the 1984 3D prison action film, Chain Gang. Here we go. All right, ready for Chain Gang here, Pete? Working on it. <laughs> You're listening to the Fan to Fan Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Bernie Gonzalez. On the chain gang with me, Pete Charbonneau, joining me as we're talking about Earl Owens B. Another installment in his 3D filmography, 1984's Chain Gang. Well, you know, like uh, Chrissy Hine and the Pretenders sang back on the chain gang here, can Earl the Pearl strike gold again with, with <laughs> chain gang? I'd, uh, we're about to find out, and wow, right. uh, I, I hope my voice can hold up because uh, it, it's fading fast. I'm not sure why. May, I may have been, Bernie, I may have been doing a little too much uh, singing from some of the <laughs> songs in, in Chain Gang last night. It sapped my vocal cords a bit, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to power through. For those that are not familiar, we decided to take on the task of watching 80s 3D films, and if folks are listening and they grew up in that era like we did, they would think that we would have talked about Friday the 13th 3D, Amityville 3D, Jaws 3D, but no, we took The Road Less Traveled, and we've talked about Metal Storm, The Destruction of Jared Sin, Parasite, Silent Madness, which was a first-time watch for both of us, and Coming At You, the 1981 Spaghetti Western that kind of really started this whole 80s 3D trend. And in our Googling and YouTubing, as we went down all the rabbit holes, we ran into a little movie called Rottweiler, aka Dogs of Hell, released in 1983. And when you run into a title like that, it just begs for you to hit the play button. And after watching it, we realized that we had to put something else in our queue, Earl Owensby, the producer of Rottweiler. And and boy, did we learn about Earl Owensby, the Cecil B. DiMaggio of the Bible Belt, <laughs> <laughs> the man who brought us movies, not just Rottweiler, a.k.a. Dogs of Hell, but also had six movies that he released in 3D through his Earl Owensby Studios. Three-dimensional pictures was an idea that had come of age, and Earl began production on the first 3D movie shot in the United States in 25 years. And even though his version was an updated technique and a great improvement over the old 1950s method, this was one of the few times that Owensby didn't face things realistically. This was one time when Earl Owensby's golden touch didn't even bring in silver. Chain Gang, the movie we're talking about today, it's one of them, Pete. The man who put ah in South Carolina. <laughs> For us, what started out as a lark. Yes. Like, oh, yeah, well, let's tackle some 80s 3D movies. We'll, we'll do this in a couple of episodes and we've done. So it started out as a lark. Yes. Did you say, Bernie, it, it may now be an obsession. Yeah, I would agree. And the thing is, too, is we're both creatives, but I think there's also that part of us that we share where we're also completionist. I, I can sit through Friday the 13th Part 3, right? The disco music, it's kind of fun. It's it's a good installment in the franchise. Can't say that much about Jaws 3D. But, you know, when you get to movies that neither one of us have heard about, and that's saying something because we've watched a lot of trash. I'm <laughs> glad that uh, that we've gone down this rabbit hole, that we discovered or Owens B, found other people online that have now come to us and said, oh, yeah, like I was a member of his church. Or I remember watching this movie and it was on VHS. And it, it's it's more like we're catching up with the Earl Owensby fan club. And now we are also members of the fan club. People can't see it because, you know, we're an audio medium. But I'm wearing my, my 70s uh, sunglasses here in honor of Earl. You know what? I, I was thinking about this earlier today. I am loving the fact that there is this whole subgenre of like, South Carolina based one man essentially like ordering the market on South Carolina cinema that before now, like you and I had not even a whiff of knowledge of wholly oblivious. And again, like, yeah, we've consumed a lot. We've consumed highbrow films. We've consumed the lowest of the lowbrow films. So like we've kind of like Han Solo, we've been from one end of this galaxy to another. <laughs> we've seen a lot of crazy Citizen stuff. Kane to Citizen Toxie. We've seen it all, folks. <laughs> But I've never seen anything like Earl Owensby. I, you know, I love the fact that we are still discovering 
things out there that were just completely off our radar. I think that's one of the, the beautiful things about this podcast uh, is the discovery that we both had separately and together. And you know, to have this little genre that we're now diving into, I- I'm loving it. I, you know, I can't say that the films are all great or even good, but I'm, I'm just loving educating myself on a slice of Americana that I was just completely oblivious to. The best comparison to an Earl Owensby for folks that are listening, and I imagine if you're listening to this, it's because you're probably our kindred spirits to Pete and me, where you grew up watching Foreman and Charles Band movies. Like you grew up watching Samurai Sunday, badly dubbed martial arts, Shaw Brothers films. And when you think of Earl Owensby, if you've never heard his name before, that's kind of the group picture we've kind of put him in, right? Larry Cohen, Roger Corman, Charles Band, Charles B. Pierce, except like you said, regional where he focused on the Bible Belt on the Southwest and maybe in some ways now in retrospect, self-awareness is a blessing because he maybe knew his appeal was very niche, very specific. So he didn't go for wide distribution. He didn't stretch himself beyond his means. I'm going to make these drive-in grindhouse films. I'm going to stay in these states where I can control distribution, where I know I'm not going to lose money. And because of that, I think what we discovered in Rottweiler even filmmakers like Tarantino, and you know, he can certainly go into the uh, deep end of the pool as far as like exploitation and schlock, but he was aware of Earl Owensby because I think, again, folks like Tarantino grew up with him. We're now just catching up with that and at kind of adding it to our catalog of, of films. And when you see what he accomplished, find out he creates Frank Challenge, a copycat of Walking Tall. I saw Walking Tall. People say Gone with the Wind influenced me. Gone with the Wind didn't influence me at all. Walking Tall influenced me because Walking Tall was made over in McMinnville, Tennessee for about a million three hundred thousand dollars with Joe Don Baker playing Buford Purser. And the sucker did about forty million. Now forty million back then was a whole lot of money. We wasn't into these hundred million dollar mega buck blockbusters at that time. And uh, I said, that's the kind of film I need to do. And that gets him out of the gate with a, a successful movie that makes money. After that, Earl Owensby, the man, the myth, the legend, also the name of the documentary on YouTube. He takes that like Billy Jack, Walking Dead wannabe. Challenge. Earl Owensby is Frank Challenge, a man who turns away from politics to seek out true justice. Small town crime and corruption type of tale that really rang well in like the 70s and into the early 80s. He ran with it, makes a bunch of other movies. Some of them movies that for folks that are listening, you may have heard of them. You may not have heard of them. Dark Sunday in 1976, Death Driver in 1977, Wolfman in 1979 that we have not seen, but we do know is a movie that's supposed to be a kind of universal monsters, hammer horror type tale but folks maybe don't have English accents because they have South Carolinian accents. <laughs> so that's that's Earl Owensby. And after we saw Rottweiler, a.k.a. Jaws with Paws, <laughs> then now we're going down the rest of the other six 3D movies he made. Hot Air in 1984. Pete, we haven't talked about that one, but it really is about a guy who has to win an air balloon race to to earn his inheritance. So Hot Air, H-E-I-R, in 1984. I mean, come on. This is so good. Uh, this this man just gift that keeps on giving. You know, and one of the things that I find interesting about Earl, you know, we talk a lot about like that earnest awfulness of people like Mark Borchardt that did American Movie, Tommy Wiseau, The Room you know, stuff like Birdemic and things like that, where you've got like, these people putting stuff out there into the world that was probably not their original intention, kind of turned out a little askew, but people find all this joy in. And you sent me a, a Washington Post article about Earl from 1984, where I think he was premiering Chain Gang. Right, and yep. this guy definitely knew what he was doing. Like he come, he's quoted as basically saying like, yeah, we ripped off Walking Tall. Like this was a very deliberate thing on his part. And like you said, like he knew how to do... St- stuff on the cheap, turn the profit, release it locally, earn some money with some foreign distribution. Well, I absolutely stumbled into the overseas market. Cinemation Industries picked up Challenge and, and, and paid me a lot of money, and they, they distributed worldwide, and when they went bankrupt, we got Challenge back, and when we got Challenge back, uh, we got the books and the auditing on it, and that's how I realized there's an international market. I mean, people over in uh, South Africa paid $20,000. 
for the right to show it in Germany. I like 80,000. I said, wait a minute. You mean these people buy it? I just thought about when I made the movie, I thought, well, I'll get to Georgia and North and South Carolina. Yeah, I ain't going to be New York, Hollywood. And all of a sudden, it was there. So I started making movies, and I really didn't care whether they ever was released or not. It didn't matter to me. It didn't make no difference at all. I thought, hey, you don't play it, play it. Don't want to play it. Don't worry about it. Because I had that cash flow coming from the international market. And then just put it back into churning out more because I think he starred or directed or produced like over 35 mm -hmm. films. And again, like I was thinking about this, you could get away with something like that because a lot of his movies are basically just the, the equivalent now would be like go on Netflix and watch Transmorphers instead of Transformers or something yeah. like that. But this is made, th these are made, I say a little, uh, I don't know, maybe not less cynically because it is, it was done pretty cynically, but. But this was back at a time when you didn't have streaming. If you went to your video store and you wanted to rent Cool Hand Luke and it was out, you were either going to have to come back another day and hope to get it then, or, oh, hey, uh, I have this movie Chain Gang that's, you know, that's right here. You can rent that. And basically, it's, it's kind of the same thing. Maybe not in terms of quality, but like you're going to get the same gist of it. And he, he was able to corner this market like he had his own film studio he had plans for you know an amusement park and 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 condominiums and hotels and i don't think all of that came to fruition but this guy kind of knew what his niche was or niche and exploited the hell out of it and was pretty damn successful in the process so i i he continues to fascinate me 100 percent. and that awareness this guy just played into it because star wars comes out 77 and then he makes a movie called Hyperspace, a.k.a. Gremloids. And we will certainly be talking about that, folks. So tune into that episode. He makes Hit the Road Running, which is just a ripoff of Cannonball. And he does that in 1987. I can't remember off the top of my head when Cannonball came out. I'm sure it was probably pretty close to right before 1987. I think uh, it was so early 80s. Uh, early 80s. First one was like 81, maybe, and Cannonball Run 2, 82, 83. There you go. Like, We've got. Yeah, Jaws comes out in, uh, was it 75, I believe? Mm -hmm. And he makes Jaws with Paul's Rottweiler, aka Dogs of Hell, in 83. So there's a way where it, it's like you're saying, you go, to the, you go to the video store and you don't have first blood. So what do you do? Well, if you're Canon Films, you make Missing in Action. And in this case, Earl Owensby had that awareness to say, I'm going to do this, this industry, that uh, regional industry that I can control. And then when the VHS market booms, yeah, maybe you can't rent Cannonball Run or Star Wars, but you, you can rent Gremloids and you can rent Hit the Road Running. And it's impressive. I, I'm, again, every time we find out more about this guy and we watch one of his films, I feel like I'm more impressed by what he did uh, than what he produced. <laughs> but I, I'm not going to take anything away from him because 30 plus films later, like you mentioned, uh, you, you got to give him all the credit. Guy's a character. Guy's like a Earl, character. Earl, you, uh, <laughs> you rap scallion, you. Love this guy. All right, so let's dig into a little chain gang here, uh, Pete. And I think this one, uh, I was trying to set us up here a little bit. Like a lot of his movies, they feel like they are inspired by other films. And we are kids of the 80s, so we were inspired by you know a lot of the stuff we grew up with, Star Wars, James Bond. But then before that, 60s, 70s, you had a lot of prison and prison escape movies. So I did some digging because I have to imagine some of these had to have inspired Chain Gang. So you've got like Great Escape, of course, like McQueen, Donald Pleasance, James Colburn. That's like the war movie. Longest Yard with Burt Reynolds, completely different tone. Former NFL player, disgraced. You One know, of uh, my favorite movies too. I really? absolutely love the Longest Yard, and I was thinking. Certainly, there's, there's and, and just, just for clarity, Reynolds, not Sandler. Just I just want to be oh, sure. Yeah, one, yeah, hundred okay. percent. The the original, not not the Adam Sandler remake. We, but it's, it, <laughs> we, we we may not cover that one. Uh, Papillon, talk about Steve McQueen and Dustin Hoffman. Great movie. Escape from Alcatraz with Eastwood. I haven't seen that in a long time, but when I saw that on the list, I was like, oh wow, I have to revisit that. Birdman of Alcatraz with Burt Lancaster. And of course, Cool Hand Luke with Paul Newman. I think uh, George Kennedy is in that as well. And I think that is probably a closer influence to Chain Gang because I know there were Grindhouse movies like Caged Heat where you had yeah, the like- Penitentiary comes to yeah, yeah, yeah. Women in prison type of trope. But I feel like those were less influential for Chain Gang than were things like Longest Yard and Cool Hand Luke. That, that, that's more what we're talking about. I, th I think you're right. And uh, I, I will come out and say that the the Southern prison 
uh, film genre is not my strong suit. So I never even <laughs> see Cool Hand Luke, although I, I understand and recognize that that is a classic. So, but that being said, and if you listening are also like me, not well versed in these type of films, uh, you don't need to be because Chain Gang, you're you're gonna recognize the tropes. Like it's very. It's a prison run by the crooked warden in the swamp. Yeah. And there's other, you know, there's the the brothel and the guy that's running the brothel, uh, played by Leon Rippey. That's uh, right. That we'll uh, come back to uh, as we explore some more Earl films. But uh, if there's anyone that would be a recognizable, if not name, a recognizable face in these movies, this guy has been in just a, a ton of things. So like character actor, you would certainly recognize him if you saw him. To, to roll off a couple of things, like he was in Eight Legged Freaks, he was in The Patriot, he was on Deadwood. He's done a ton of stuff from South Carolina, so yep. clearly part of the the Owensby troop in in this and subsequent films. And in this one, she's like a crime boss, mobster, and it works. It does, yeah. And you know, right from the get go, you know, I was I was pleasantly surprised when I started the the movie. Okay, and you've got a very cinematic opening. You've got your sun drenched sky it's like sun is setting you've got your chain gang workers kind of you know i don't know exactly what they're doing they're doing what chain gangs do clearing yep. some you know brush on the side of the road or whatever but um, nicely silhouetted against the the, the sun it was yeah. yeah yeah i was like okay so they're you know and i think that's that's something about a lot of his films again like super low budget but not without some aesthetic merit and so i was like okay you know, this, I don't know when this was shot. I know it came out early 80s, but again, like this, this movie feels very mid to late 70s to me. It yep. just kind of came out in 84, but it feels like okay. everything we found out about this guy, he had a quick turnaround. So my suspicion is if this was shot in like 82, 83, I don't think he left things on the shelf to, uh, to gather much dust. He probably shot it 83, edited it, got it out of the door in 84. Yep. We were finishing a movie on Saturday night, usually right at dark, and starting a new one on Monday morning. You know, we didn't know we'd finish that one and start another one. So it wasn't no, you know, we had a regular eight to five job or a little longer than that, but, you know, six days a week, continuously. And uh, that's unheard of in the movie business. It's just unheard of. So, yeah, so where, where do we want to go, I mean, it, it's a plot that we've seen and, and, and watched yep. thousands of times before. Uh, wrongly convicted man gets sent to prison and uh, is treated like shit by the evil warden and yep. his deputies and then, um, you know, needs to exact revenge, clear his name. I, I did find it, I found it pretty funny at the opening where he is, you know, driving his, uh, you know, his, his sporty car <laughs> off, off on the highway and you know pulls up to uh like a honky tonk strip club immediately comes across like one of the the bouncers or the guy working at the at the strip club harassing one of the strippers who just wants to get out she's kind of done and set up and what the hell do you think you're doing you're on next what does it look like i'm doing i've had it with this joint i'm out of here you wait just a minute, you little slut. You signed a legal contract with Mr. Loman, and you still owe him. Well, let's take it to court. How would the great Mr. Loman like his contract to be public record, huh? How would he like the whole county knowing just how he snags women into these deals? Let me tell you something, Miss Smartass. You better not cross him. You tell him to take his contract and stick it up his ass. You know, he's getting handsy with her, so Earl literally just walks in the door doesn't even have time to to assess the situation punches this guy in the face and then immediately leaves with the woman and and they're being chased so it's like there's like no character development either we just see him driving sees the strip club goes in there's more character development for the stripper and the boss who's trying to keep her there and then manhandling her than there is for the main character of the movie it's literally he opens the door and what do they call it uh in media reus i think that's like the cinematic term right the james bond cold open we see him in the middle of something yeah earl was in the middle of driving <laughs> that's yeah. I mean. like he wasn't doing anything where we're like oh let's let's get to know this guy is he married is he a salesman why is he traveling is what's going on it's literally he's going to a strip club stripper doesn't want to be there anymore she gets manhandled he's gentlemanly and stops the goons from beating her up and then they leave in his car that's our intro to our main character. And, and she, I think she asks him at some point, like, 
where he's from or what he's doing. He's like, he's like, I'm just passing through, like yes, passing through. But somehow it was like, oh, hey, look, it's uh, it's Stardust, the strip club. I got to stop it here on my on my drive. But you know, you really don't get any other information about Earl, and I think that's in keeping. He, I think he's on record as you know, he he had, certainly is is no Shakespearean thespian. He's just kind of on screen to punch out bad guys and blow away bad guys. And I think the less dialogue he has is probably best served for everyone, including the audience. So he does know his limitations. And so he limits his dialogue and uh, his character development accordingly. Yeah. Pretty tight lip. There's a few times where I was waiting for yeah. the character to be revealed. And I think you, it's something you mentioned earlier. If people have not watched these films, Cool Hand Luke, Papillon, it's okay. You've seen the film. Like Pete said, you know the tropes because you've seen Shawshank. You've seen The Green Mile. You've seen those movies where, again, convicted of the wrong crime and then meets assorted characters in the prison. And after Owens B ends up in the hotel with the stripper, gets convicted of a framed for a crime he didn't commit, then he gets hauled off to the prison. And then we get to meet all of the cast of characters because uh, like some of them were right out of central casting, like the preacher kind of religious guy who ends mm -hmm. up uh, pulling out a guitar and seems to be good natured. You know, you get like the guy who's a little kind of like steel eyed veteran who who's a little quiet, but you know, he's seen some shit. There's like the one guy who's, if you told me he was related to Tarantino, like maybe a cousin, I would believe it because Freddie is his name, uh, the character, but he he's the guy who, and always has a plan for escape. And Owens B, again, as he gets thrown in this prison, happens to stumble onto this guy who's like, I've got a plan. I know how we can get out of here. Doesn't work out for our friend Freddie. You're going down the list. Here are a bunch of people, and we're just going to get to meet them along the way through the movie, through Owens B, as he gets to meet them. And th that's the movie. You've seen this movie before. You haven't seen it, but you've seen it. Yeah. You've got like the gentle giant uh, yes. guy as well. I did find it funny before he gets to prison. So we'll spoil some stuff because, you know, whatever. This movie, <laughs> you know, this is not really worth not spoiling. I think, I think it's fair to say, Pete, anyone who's listening to this, one, they're going to already know this film and there's no surprises here. Yeah. Uh, or two, they're going to listen to us and just realize that they don't maybe need to watch the film <laughs> because again, okay. not that it's yeah, bad, we're, we're, but they're going to be like, I got it. I listened to the guys talk right. about it. I'm good. <laughs> we're either piquing your curiosity or we're doing you a favor. So you can, yes. whichever one, that, that is entirely your choice. That's right. Um, Sorry. He, he gets framed in the hotel or the motel because Leon Rippey's character, Loman and his goons yes. track him and the woman down. He goes, they, he gets the room. He immediately goes into the bathroom to take a leak or something like that. He mm -hmm. comes out. The woman is in bed, topless. Again, I think another chance of just for an exploitative, like topless scene. Sure. And she's like, "Well, she's like, you saved me, so you know, it's it's only right that I, I pay you back." And he, yep. he seems like he's up for it. And then, of course, the goons break in. They kill her. What are you doing? <sighs> Come off it! I owe you one, right? Well, look, I've played this little game before, so let's just cut through all the bulls. You beg me uh, real nice now, and I'll make it real quick. Go to hell! Uh, Have it your way. Knock him out. He gets framed for it. First laugh out loud moment. Well, no, second one. The first one was when he punched the guy in the face when he just walked into the strip club. <laughs> um, is he, there's a quick scene where he's on trial and he barely says a word. The lawyer is like, his own lawyer is like, yeah, it's not looking good for you. <laughs> yes. Jerry's back in. Let's go. I don't even know what I'm doing here, but Pearson, you haven't listened to a damn thing I've said in six weeks. Ain't nothing personal, man. You're just working with the same people trying to put me away with something I didn't do. Yeah, but you gotta admit, that's a pretty flimsy story you've been telling. It's the truth. Besides, ain't that what this trial's supposed to be about? In principle, yeah, but the way you're going about it, I gotta tell you, I don't think you got much of a chance. Yes. And he gets convicted, and as he's sentenced, he's just sitting there. There's, like, no emotion on his face. And I couldn't tell if he's trying to do stoic or if he's just like, 
I'm just not a good actor. So let's just <laughs> put the camera on me for a second and let's cut. We find the defendant guilty of murder in the second degree. Will the defendant please rise? Edward Ray McPherson, you are hereby sentenced to a term of not more than, nor less than, 15 years. This sentence is to be carried out in the state prison system under the supervision of the Commissioner of Corrections. Sentence is to begin immediately. Earl doesn't even say anything like, all right, well, can I say my piece? Maybe I can Can I get a new lawyer? He doesn't say anything. He just (laughs) goes along with it. Um, He is wooden, kind of lifeless through a good chunk of it. The strong, silent type uh, didn't always work. I could see how it could work for this, but he wasn't able to pull it off. A wild thing, and I will, I'll, I'll mention one here and I'll mention one later. This, at two different points, reminded me of Planet of the Apes movies, which I'm absolutely 100% sure was completely unintentional on whoever made the first part. <laughs> the first instance is when he is literally sent up the river for 15 years on a boat that has like this square cage on it that reminded me of like Charlton Heston when he gets, you know, first land. Oh, yeah back on earth and like you need to <laughs> capture him with like the other humans. It's like in like this square cage thing. I'm like, this looks like exactly like planet. I'm like, this is so wild. I'll, I'll mention the second one later because I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves. But uh, he's in the swamps of, I assume, South Carolina. The little island prison that uh, that he gets uh, sent to. Uh, it was a Black Creek Correctional Facility. It, in, yeah. it ain't no summer camp, as we're told. Yeah, with the warden who comes out wearing a, a Washington Redskins hat <laughs> and refers to himself as a world-class son of a bitch. That's right. I'm Harry Bates. I'm the warden here at Black Creek Correctional. Oh, the name's not important. You'll all soon find out why I have the reputation of being a first-class son of a bitch. And is actually a little underwhelming considering when you think of like the warden from Shawshank Redemption, where you know that guy's just mean. This guy, if you told me he was an accountant for the prison, I'd be like, yeah, that that yeah. that makes sense. He he's right. not as mean as you would expect. Makes sense because again, uh, we find out later that yeah, there's a there's a whole little scheme going on uh, that he's kind of benefiting from. You made a great call with the warden there. I I was like, you know, he's kind of like the. He comes across as like the kindly assistant principal at a, yes. at like a junior high school, but yep. he, he sputters out these lines that are supposed to be threatening. And it's pretty comical because the guy playing him is trying his best, but uh, it doesn't, he doesn't really have the face for the uh, second class son of a bitch, not first class. Right. Yeah. World class is he's pushing it a little bit, but he wants to be intimidating. That's I was right. worried in that scene where he, he starts reading off like the new shipment of prisoners names. And they all start making like some comment. I was like, there's a lot of dozen guys here. This is going to be a 20 minute scene. Uh, we, can we just cut to the chase here? Like, I get it. You're mean. You told us as much. I'm going to take you on your word. Let's move on. Let's see what we have. Chapman, Robert D. Here, yes, sir. I uh, <clears throat> prefer to be called Gideon. <clears throat> no back talk scum. <clears throat> Son, we don't give a damn what you want or don't want. It's what we want around here that counts. Hmm? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> McPherson, Rafe E. Yes, sir, Warden. McPherson, I think it only fair to warn you that I think what you did was disgusting. You know, I hate to see men like you come through these gates. And do you want to know why? Yes, sir. Because I pride myself on being fair and impartial. But when I see someone the likes of you, I have all I can do to restrain myself from breaking your filthy, slimy neck. And Earl just kind of remains silent there's not really like a back and forth yeah like he he's respectful because he does like the yes sir yes sir. but the warden's still giving him like the stink guy because he knows like there's something up with this guy he's he's, he's trouble i can smell it that's right i'm a world-class son of a bitch i can smell trouble remember you can find the fan to fan podcast at www.fanpodcast.com facebook just search fan to fan podcast that's F A N, the number two, F A N, on Instagram at Fan to Fan Podcast, or on Twitter at Fan to Fan Podcast. We'd love to hear from you, so send a message and let us know what you think of the show. Thanks. And now, on with the show. Talking about Earl, since uh, we've gotten, we're at the point where we're on a first name basis with Earl, so I, I feel comfortable saying that. So this movie comes out 1984, and 
Rottweiler, aka Dogs of Hell, came out in 1983. Did Earl look a little rougher on the edges to you, Pete? Because he I, looked he looked a little a bit more heavy set. But I'm not you know I'm not going to make fun of the guy because you know he had an extra donut. That's not what what we're here for. I'm just like man, he didn't look like he was in good health in this one compared to the movie we just saw him shoot a year before. And I'm assuming Rottweiler was probably produced, filmed. 81, 82, and it comes out in 83. And I'm like, man, a year later, this guy's aged like 20 years. I'm glad you you caught that too. I thought the same thing. And, and okay. again, referring back to the, the Washington Post article, like he's referenced in that as being 48 for the premiere of Chain Gang. I'm 50 years old. I'm, I'm trying to be as humble as possible when I say that I feel like I look 20 years younger than he does. <laughs> he looks, at, he yes. looks haggard. And, and we know his life. I mean, he certainly had a very tough upbringing. He's a veteran. That's true. They they mentioned in the in the article, you know, the forty year old former tool salesman turned actor producer that has made this mini empire in the South. But yeah, there was just something about it. As I was looking at it, it was like he looked a little bit more lively, and he was driving around that Jeep uh, without the top on. And this guy's going to be a character. And in this, I was like, whoa, whoa. Is this getting to you? Are you taking your vitamins, man? Like, what's going on? Was this like right around divorce number two or something? Maybe like I don't. We don't want to speculate too much on on (laughs) on our personal life in this because you know we're here to talk about chain gang. That's right. That's right. Although he did say in that Washington Post article in a reply to the uh, to the journalist who wrote it, if you like the movie, tell someone. If you don't, keep your mouth shut. So. Earl, you're you're a treasure either way, Mr. Matt McPherson. <laughs> so, thank okay, you. so thank you, Mac. I, I'm glad you called him Mac McPherson because I was having a hard time figuring out what his first name was because the first time it, it said, did they call him Mads McPherson? I'm like, like Mads Mickelson. I'm like, okay, well, that's interesting. And then I heard it again. I'm like, is it Mad? They're calling him Mad McPherson. And then. I heard Mac McPherson, and I'm like, please tell me his name is not really Mac McPherson. Like Mac McPherson, is nickname, okay, but Mac McPherson, wow. Mac Mac, gotta gotta love Mac this Mac. guy. I also saw on Wikipedia this was based on a true story, and I'd like to think that that's also <laughs> not a true story. <laughs> I'm sure there was someone that unfortunately has been framed for a crime in our justice system, and that's very unfortunate. It's really sad. I yeah. don't think it was this character, Mac McPherson, and I think many liberties were probably taken in the telling of this tale. <laughs> yeah, the, the true story is that this is a made-up story. <laughs> but yes. Uh, um, all right. So, can we, talk for, can we talk a quick second about <laughs> the bearskin rug that Earl sleeps with in prison? Oh wait, I'm sorry. No, that was his, that was his chest. There's a scene with him just laying on his cot in the prison bunkhouse. The way it's shot from like a low angle, so it's shot kind of like from his waist up. So you kind of just see the undulating tufts of like body hair. It's not like it's not like a Bermuda Triangle around the chest area. Like this, you talk about like a Sasquatchian mm-hmm. coverage on on the torso. Earl Earl's got it. Earl's got it going on. He brings his own rug everywhere he goes. He he's got his own rug. I think he donated some to the one guy. The one guy is is literally there's like a beaver pelt on his head. Uh, and I think <laughs> might have just Earl might have just lent him some. Like it. You, again, you gotta love Earl. You just gotta love everything about. He's this very guy. giving. He is a That's giving, right. giving man. A hundred percent. So so this movie, because again, you know, we don't want to do the disservice if you haven't seen this. We're not going to go beat by beat. You should go watch this. It's ironically enough for a man who seemed to be very aware of his market and how to get a good return on his investments and on his productions. His movies are not readily available. It's not like you can go on Amazon and find them. Uh, And Pete and I usually are, not not to pat ourselves on the back, we usually try to do right by folks. And like, if it's available, like I'll buy it and I get it. Amazon may only give them a few cents, but they did the work. I feel like I can give them the $1.99 to 99 cents, considering a lot of the movies we find are in that 99 cents category. But Earl's movies are not out there on Blu-ray or DVD. I've seen a few VHS movies, again, completely motivated by our discovery of this guy that have popped up on eBay. But a lot of these movies we find on YouTube. So you too will be able to find them on YouTube and you can kind of watch them on your own. But since we're not going beat by beat, are there any moments, Pete, after this introduction that struck a chord with you? Well, there are a few because we're already uh, almost a half hour into this episode uh, because we are covering 80s 3D movies. 
And I feel like we're entering the territory <laughs> where this may have been shot in 3D. It may have been screened in 3D. Kind of hard to really, and we've done this on previous episodes. If you've listened to our previous episodes, Bernie and I usually have our own lists of like, oh, here's our list of scenes that were clearly done yes. for the 3D market. There's Metal Storm, the destruction of Jared Sin, where Ball's arm is spewing, you know, the you can't do that on television green you know, <laughs> style the camera and things like that. Really difficult with the exception of a, a very few moments to pick out. Yes. What was 3D in this movie? And what's what's nice is in having watched all these movies, and in some ways, I don't want to say we're experts, Pete, but we're we're getting close. If if there's got an eye. We've yeah, got an eye. Yeah. If we're gonna have something in our parentheses, like, you know, 80s 3D movie specialist or whatever the acronym is for that, like we're getting pretty close to that because we saw Coming at You came out in 1982, 81, 82, and that kind of sparked everything. But it turns out Earl purchases a number of uh, stereo vision lenses that were made by Chris Condon, who also worked on Joss 3D, Parasite, and Metal Storm, The Destruction of Jared Sin. And then after he saw the novelty that was coming at you and realized that he could add this extra layer of gimmick, of production value, whatever you want to call it to his movies, he said, yep, all my movies now will be done in 3D. That's why when we ran into it, we're like, whoa, who is this guy? who made six movies in 3D, and why haven't we heard of him? And of course, you know, we, we start checking off the movies off the list. So that all happens, the 3D explosion in like 81, 82. So by the time 84 comes out, you would think, like some of the other movies we saw coming at you, knives, machetes at the screen, explosions, uh, like you mentioned, Metal Storm, The Destruction, you know, Jared Sin, you got to see the whole thing. Lasers, freaking lasers, you know, coming right at you. This one, except for two or three times, Pete, it was few and far between. And yeah. this is not like Space Hunter or we think Metal Storm to Destruction of Jurdson, where you had pointed out maybe this was a conversion where you ride the coattails because it's doing okay. Maybe we can get a few more asses in the seats. So let's put some stuff in there and make it 3D instead of a, all right, well, we're shooting it purposely in 3D because we've seen both. Yeah. Few and far between to find some of those 3D moments in Chain Gang. Yeah, I did. The first one that I noted was didn't come until the 51 minute mark. And uh, surprise, surprise, like Earl, you know, escapes the prison at one point and he's on the run with the sister of the girl that gets murdered in the hotel room. That's right. Has evidence that he thinks is going to exonerate him and for some reason kind of believes that he didn't do it. Yeah. And so they escape the brothel house run by Loman who is in cahoots with the warden is kind of supplying women. And there's like, they've got like a relationship where Loman's kind of, you know, paying him off. There's, you know, we said there, there's like a little web going on there, a little criminal uh, organization happening. So Earl's on the run. He's in the woods he's being chased by the deputies. And then one of the uh, deputies takes a stick to the gut and <laughs> yeah, does the old like stick, you know, holds it there in front of the camera so that you can get a good shot of the 3D. That was the first one that I could recall. I was like, okay, so that's there's your 3D shot, and that's yep. almost that, that was it was it was on my list too. This is always fun when we kind of do like if this if we had our TV show, this would be like the 3D effects, and we'd go through and try to remember what we saw and to see if we matched up that one for sure. When Freddie Tarantino's cousin is taken into the woods and killed, I feel like there's a shot where the correctional officer shoots him because you know he basically does the like. If you tell me everything you know about your escape plan and what you were planning and how you did it, then I'll take it easy on you and I won't kill you. Spoiler alert, he kills him. So Tarantino's cousin no longer going to the Tarantino family reunion because, you know, he's dead. But I thought the squib and the way it was mm -hmm. shot literally looked a little off. Again, sometimes when we watch some of these movies, the effect is kind of a little bit of a giveaway because yeah. of the technology that we're using. And it just felt like there was something off in the layering where I'm like, okay, maybe the the blood splatter was 3D, not so much the gun pointed at the screen, because those are the easy ones to spot. So maybe this right. was a little more nuanced. Uh, <laughs> mind you, I just realized I said that for an Earl Onesby movie uh, <laughs> versus the stomach where it literally is, he's shoving it in your face and you're seeing it in 3D. Yeah. Nu nuance is, uh, is usually in short supply in these that's right. films, that's for sure. Uh, the only other one that I'd 
picked out was again like 20 minutes left in the movie okay yep probably same thing i have big prison break scene and again spoiler alert everyone breaks out of the prison (laughs) pretty much everyone dies like earl literally almost all of his friends killed yes but uh there is wait wait, we have to talk about that now because the one guy in the lineup who the warden points out is saying i'm just gonna put my head down i want to see my family and i want to be done and the warden's like, you know what? I'm a first class son of a bitch, but do what he says and we'll be fine. I like his answer. That's right. Everyone else that's not this guy and Earl dies. <laughs> they, they do They do not make it through the escape. They, they do not get out of a Black Creek Correctional Facility. But this inmate number four does. And when he has that moment with Earl where Earl has to make the choice, does he get back and avenge himself for the people who framed him, who did him wrong? Prison number four just does the kind of like, good luck be on your way. But in that entire escape, that's where you saw those 3D effects. Because I'm guessing probably, again, same thing I think I saw, explosions and guns. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, there's just mayhem at the end of this movie. Like the 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 correctional officers are blowing everyone away. There's no shortage of M16s in this movie, just like <laughs> firing away, like clip after clip. Like I don't, uh, there's a couple of shots of of, uh, of guys reloading, but for the most part, it's just like a, a hail of gunfire. And guys, I mean, it, and it gets bloody. You know, like you mentioned the squibs. There are a lot of squib. There's a lot of squib work in this one. There's a, a lot of blood lying everywhere. But again, like Earl, he gets captured. He goes to the police with what he thinks is evidence. But of course, the police commissioner is in on it. So he doesn't believe him. So he, throw, he brings him back to the prison. He gets thrown in the box. Yep. Which leads to uh, just an incredible music number. Um, <laughs> I'm glad you brought it up. <laughs> where Earl is just like, it, it's a kind of a montage of him just there like with the light peering in like one of the slats of the of the box on his eye like he's got it's supposed to be like black and blue marks it looks like he's got chocolate frosting all over his face (laughs) and uh and this is why this is why my voice is a little scraggly right now because i was singing this song and i'm not going to sing it now because i don't have the tune in my head so we're gonna do a little spoken word but i I thought that the lyrics and bernie if you want to you know kick the kick the song in uh, in post, you know, go go right ahead. But got it. I'm do a little spoken word on this song that plays while Earl is kind of like, you know, his spirit's kind of broken at this point. Like he, that's right. His escape has has failed. He he thought he had evidence exonerating himself. That's failed. He's back back in the uh, in the box, and you know, and his friends are, you know, they they're definitely on his side, his fellow inmates. But there's nothing they can do to help him, and he's just kind of sweating away in here. And this song kicks in with the. Uh, little country lick, (laughs) and it goes a little something like this. Again, spoken word here. The many years I've lived still haven't taught me that freedom is a prize we have to earn. I have wandered toward the dark side, and I've tried to touch the sun. But either way, my spirit still gets burned. But either way, my spirit still gets burned. I tell the gun more often than the Bible. I know the devil better than the Pope. Sometimes I still see heaven, but I'm looking there from hell because I can't let go of Satan's deadly soul. No, I can't let go of Satan's deadly soul. The shadows from my past return to haunt me, and the good times are just water under the bridge. I'm trying hard to grab hold of tomorrow, let it take me someplace where the truth will always live. To some place where the truth will always live. Goddamn God Earl. Damn. God damn Earl, you've done it again. Goddamn Icarus. He just done. flew too close to the sun. Too close. Too Ooh, close. I Earl. just gave myself shivers. So just for the record, just so we have that on, on, on the podcast record, that was Earl that sang that, right? I don't know that it was. I, it may be. Maybe. Doesn't it feel like it would have been him? I mean, for all intents and purposes, it was. It yeah. was Earl singing to himself as he was sweating away with his hairy chest in that, that sweat box. Oh, man, Earl. All right, I, I throw out a few random things because I have to I have to remember this. And it's hard to follow the musical interlude, but I'm, I'm going to try. 
During that prison escape, does our gentle giant bear hug one of the guards to death? Uh, I, 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 that was, I wrote that question mark. <laughs> like, does, does the deputy get squeezed to death? Okay, good. I'm, I'm, I'm glad I'm that glad I, I'm glad I didn't miss see that. No, we both had the same note. A, a little callback to Rottweiler when Earl was in the back seat of one of the the main yeah. bad guys in yes. car, yes. and he comes out with the Uzi. Every horror movie trope slasher bad guys in the back seat, poor victim in the front, never notices them, never hears the breathing, doesn't see them back there. But in that inopportune moment, boom, knife to the throat, or in this case. Who's he doing with the forehead? And that's our man Earl in the backseat of the car. Which also leads to a maneuver that I've never seen on film before, which is Loman in the front seat driving with those like, you know, I don't know if he's driving a Buick or something like that. It's not like bucket seats. It's like the one one long seat. Yep. And he pulls out a revolver by his leg, turns it so that the barrel is facing to the back seat. And as he's trying to, you know, distract Earl... With the gun reversed, pulls the trigger, shooting it through this. I've never seen this move before in my entire life. There's a 30 grand right here in the front seat. I'll split it with you. What makes you think you're in a position to bargain? (laughs) You ain't right. You just plain ain't right in the head. What good's it going to do you to kill me? Well, maybe it'll just make me sleep better at nights knowing bastards like you don't always come out on top. You'll come out on top, too. You could start a whole new life with 20 grand. Price just went up, huh? Well, I think I'll pass. We're going to play up my way for a change. Yes, again. This is where the audio medium does a, does us a disservice because... That alone, it, it's worth seeing for that scene alone because I'm like, yes. is he, is he like trying? Like, because you can't aim it. Like, he's just hoping that it that it's going to hit him in the back seat, yep. And it does. So kudos yep. to the Omen. Yep, hits Earl in the side. It works, but it, it's one of those moves. If we were doing a video podcast of some sort, I'd be like, let's just cut to the clip. Because when you see Loman pull that off, it's impressive. And he does the job, right? Like he hits Earl, crashes the car, but is able to escape, runs away with, I think it's $30,000 in the bag. You know, 30 grand large. 30 yeah. grand large. And our, our man, uh, Leon Rippy makes it to the sort of, tunnel, catacomb, sewer system type thing in the middle of the swamp. But Earl, you know, now wounded, still giving chase, Uzi in hand, makes his way through these catacombs, chases after uh, Loman. He chases him down. And then we have like the the final kind of confrontation where Earl can get his revenge. And I think the other part too is, and I know you have, you mentioned you have not seen Cool Hand Luke, right? No, if I had, it was a long time ago. I don't okay. remember. I know my cousin wanted to watch it with me, and I don't think we ever did. So so this movie, it's been a while since I've seen it, but very much like when I was watching this, it was all kind of rushing back to me. The big difference between these, Paul Newman was just a really bad inmate. You know, he would do little things to try to get out and find his way back in the box, right? It reminds me a lot of like even Steve McQueen in The Great Escape. It's like, oh, there he is, that ref scallion again, trying to get away from us, but we'll put him in the box. He grabs the ball, plays a little catch with himself. 30 days later, he's back out, but still trying to find another way to get out right after that, right? While Donald Pleasance and Colbert and all the others are trying to think of something uh, something that'll get less attention on them, right? Or Earl is, you know, he's not Paul Newman, he's not Steve McQueen, but also... In that earlier attempt, that earlier escape, he does kill two guards. Yeah. I I mean, I get it. He walks into like a random police station thinking with evidence in hand. Literally, folks, he has file, a file, like manila envelopes with files that should exonerate them, uh, exonerate him from this crime. But of course, like you said, the sheriff doesn't believe in him because, you know, he's in on it too. He's corrupt. But the dude did kill two correctional officers in the woods. So they're out there with. 3D broom handles in stomach. So <laughs> it's like he, he did a little bit more than just like be a bit of a rapscallion as an inmate. He killed two folks. Uh, so he, he's not afraid. Uh, our man, Mac McPherson, he's not afraid to take a life. Clearly not. There is no hesitation on his part. That's right. And he does it at the very end. He gets uh, Loman dead to rights. And he knows uh, he's like, yep, Loman does his, uh, hey, you can take a piece of this 30 grand large, make it yours, start a new life. And he shoots him in the arm. Uh, Earl does, shoots Loman. And yeah, you're thinking- Yeah, the that's, uh, that's on full auto. That's right. You know, that's right. Shot hits him in the arm and he's that's bleeding. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Max like, hey, go ahead and throw your gun. 
all right, he's got him dead to rights. Give me the money. And at that point, Loman, and, and, and I got the sense, like at this point, like it's kind of done. I was waiting for Mac to kind of walk away. Earl Owensby has, you know, gotten his, uh, gotten enough pound of flesh as he's wanted to. He's good, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. But no, Loman kind of eggs him on. And kind of like the theme is that the justice system is corrupt. And if you know how to play by the rules, if you know how to serve your time with your head down, then you know the rules of the game. And it works for you, works in your favor. So Loman, with that last line, all right, now you're playing you're playing the game. But our our man Mac with the with the comeback. Now you're thinking, now you've got the right idea. You're gonna take that money and you're gonna go to Mexico. You live like a king. I knew you'd come around. Now you're playing the game. My rules. It dies on the vine. It, it's like, yeah. now you're playing the game. And he just kind of, as a matter of factly, says, like, my rules. Did you mean, now I'm going to play the game by my rules? My rules, my game? I don't know. Exit stage left. We're, we're done now with Mac. Credits like, roll. Oh, the credits roll. But you had a better line. Loman, now you're playing the game. Game over. That's the ending we all deserved. That was it. I saw this on Twitter. Someone someone posted a tweet and I and I took it to heart because it made a lot of sense. They they talked about like how a lot of criticism of movies these days of people basically being like just picking apart like certain parts of things like oh they used they should have done this instead or I would have done this or you know there's like this very personalized look at consuming films now where everyone's just kind of like well I would have done this cuz this would have been better for me or I would have changed this line. So I say that because it's really just a joke and it's it's kind of funny the actual line so but i do take i do take that point like i think we can be overly critical of movies sometimes to be like well i've seen 30 uh prison movies and what he really should have said in that instance is this instead of yes. that. but that's yes. but that's the beauty of of something like chain gang is that he does and he says what he says and then and then it's literally like freeze frame graphic over earl's face and credits rolling and then you're like okay well i guess i guess that's that that's the movie. And then again, I think that goes back to Earl Owens B's awareness. He knew his audience. That You can't take that away from him is that he knew who was going to watch these films, who was going to yeah. part ways with their hard-earned money at the drive-in to see these exploitation films. And I think there was, uh, again, a, why he continues to, I think, impress us in that he didn't play the Hollywood game. Never say never to Mr. Earl Owens B. Yes, he knew what people were saying, but since when did that really matter? He was going to show the Hollywood establishment what he could do without them, period. I think one of the interesting things about the opposition to Hollywood, if I can use that term, is that it spurred him. In other words, it it was an obstacle, it was a detriment, but at the same time, this is this is what drove him was that that conflict and the and the need to prove that he could do this. So it actually made uh, made the films possible. You know, he seemed to have been very lean in his productions. Let's have no question about it. Uh, Earl went into the motion picture industry because it had been a love of his from the very beginning. But he did it principally as a financial venture, and. Uh, as Earl says, economics is easy. You don't spend as much as you take in. And he was able to do that and build a very successful studio. That he never signed distribution deals that wouldn't have a return on his investment. He didn't overspend. He didn't make like an, a $10 million film. If anything, the one stat I found is that he never spent over a million dollars on any one given film. So he seemed to always be aware of if I make this movie, I'm making this for this audience and this limited distribution, so I'm going to make the movie that fits with that kind of budget. But let's remember, when I went in the movie business, I had only one place to go with my movie, and that was to either the, the theaters or the drive-ins, or I didn't go. I mean, there was no video, there was no cable, uh, there was no place like home box office showtime, there was no, uh, no pay-per-view, uh, none of that stuff exists. And uh, so to roll those dice and get into that business at that time, 
I think, and build a studio in Shelby, North Carolina, would probably have been a, a million to one shot at least. Yeah. yeah, and I think a lot of it was using friends and family on the crew yep. as actors. I think there are a couple of, aside from uh, Leon Rippey, there's a couple of people that would appear in multiple Earl Owensby films. There's a couple of people you can tell like, okay, well, these people have acted before. Yep. So you can see that there's some craft to it. There's other characters that are there that clearly were just like, do yeah, you want me to act in, in your movie? Sure, I'll do that. You know, and this is where you get people like Worth Keeter, who has like got multiple roles of being like editor, director. Mm-hmm. It's really like all hands on deck. It's very DIY. And I think that's part of the charm of these things. Because again, like Bernie and I, we we have seen some really shitty movies. There, there are legitimate like choices and shots in these movies that are like, oh, I see what they're doing. Like this is, yep, yep. this is technically sound. They know, you know, this is this makes sense. Like there's a craft to these movies, so they're low budget, but it's not like amateurish. These people know what they're doing, so there's that element to it, which again I think just makes it all the more interesting. Uh, a couple of really quick other points that I had before we we wrap this one up. Uh, on top of Earl getting all of his his buddies killed. Uh, there's a scene where he's he's like, I gotta I gotta shoot out the lights because the guards are up in the tower picking off all the prisoners. Why is he wasting bullets? Because the lights weren't like above his head so far. Like he could have even taken the butt of the gun and like you know saved some ammunition. So that was a questionable call. Uh, you'll notice that we've mentioned two women in this film. That's essentially all the women to be found in this film. And essentially, if you are a woman in this movie, you better serve to not be anywhere near uh, Matt McPherson because right. you're going to end up dead uh, within the span of about literally two minutes. Like no That's one right. no one lasts very long uh, with Earl. And it's funny because the, the movie poster for this is Earl and the sister that he, that he escapes with like in, in the swamp somewhere and she gets mowed down. You're thinking, are they going to make this woman like a love interest? I'm like, that's going to be really weird, but okay, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if that happens. Yeah, she doesn't, you know, she's barely in the movie long enough for you to even understand what her role is. Doesn't survive. The the one other thing I wanted to mention is Dee Barton does the music for this. He was a, a composer who worked on a few Owens B produced movies, including Tales of the Third Dimension, Rutherford Country Line. And he also composed the movie, uh, music for High Plains Drifter, plays Misty for Me, Thunderbolt and Lightfoot. So pretty well-known musician who scored a, a few films, but he did this one. And there's a part where, again, the, the music was, <laughs> except for that one musical number, uh, it wasn't a distraction. Like you had that sort of like rockabilly South twang kind of music, like it all fit. It, it had the sound that you would expect for this type of movie. And and it worked. There, there, there was one funny part with the music, I thought, where the, the initial escape sequence, there's like this heavy driving, heavy percussion beat going on. And uh, and then at one point, the music stops. Yes. Earl logs the, the deputy to the face, knocks him out cold, picks up the Fallout M16, and all of a sudden the music like kicks back. And it's like, <laughs> yes. which I'm just kind of like, all right, that, that's pretty funny. And, it's for drama, Pete. It was drama. Yeah, you know, that, the pregnant pause of, you know, we don't want any music because we want you to concentrate on this guy getting a log to the face. That's right. I'd be, I'd be remiss. I, I mentioned it earlier. My second Planet of the Apes reference with this. <laughs> Two of them. Earl, when he is recaptured, the warden decides to put him in leg irons, which I guess was not a thing at that point. But the warden's is kind of like, ah, for old time's sake, let's have some fun. So he slaps him in leg irons. So when Earl leads the prison break, he's like shuffling, running around because he can't run full stride because he's got the, the irons on. Totally reminded me of Roddy McDowell as Caesar in Conquest of the Planet of the Apes, where he leads the <laughs> revolution. You can't not see it if you know what I'm talking about, and you see this scene. You cannot cannot not see it now. And I'm like, my God, like not one but two Planet of the Apes references. I'm picking up on this again. I'm sure it was completely unintentional, but I kind of dig that that I saw it. If you needed a, a partner for movie trivia night, Pete is available. He can pull out those references out of nowhere and connect movies like uh, the fourth or fifth installment in the Planet of the Apes franchise to Gene Gang in 3D. Produced I'm going to write a, uh, a 6,000 word essay on the, uh, <laughs> on, the, on the symmetry between Planet of the Apes and Chain Gang. I think this was actually, in the end, more entertaining than I expected. Our motivation to watch it was 3D. So in some ways, 
it was disappointing in 3D when I think there were probably a lot of opportunities for this movie in 3D. And I'm sure if there was a restored Blu-ray or anything besides a really bad VHS copy that was uploaded to YouTube that's streaming, yeah. maybe we could see where this could be more fun to watch. This wasn't like Treasure of the Four Crowns that we talked about with Austin Trunick, who wrote literally the books on Canon Films, where he thought, you know, Treasure of the Four Crowns was okay, but so much more enjoyable when it was re-released, remastered, and mm -hmm. he could watch it in 3D as it was intended. I feel like this movie was more entertaining than I expected. I don't know if it would be more entertaining than that in 3D, but this was good. This was fun. What, what about you? Yeah, I, I'm with you on this. I was entertained. Uh, and you're right. We we watched a uh, an uploaded VHS copy on YouTube. So um, what you get in the charm of something like that, you lose in picture clarity and mm -hmm. You know, and the other little nuances that we might have picked up as far as what might have looked good as a, a, a 3D composed shot, because I'm sure there was some more, but like you, you lose it a bit watching it on the aspect ratio. And again, like the quality is not great. It's certainly serviceable to enjoy the movie on YouTube. But um, yeah, I think if we were to get a properly restored version, I, I would be interested in seeing that maybe get a little more insight as to what else was 3D about this movie. The technology was there. He invested the money in the cameras. So we're going to make a bunch of 3D movies. And there's like two or three shots that poke something at the camera at you and everything else is maybe supposed to be more just depth. But yep. you really can't, you can't get a good assessment of that watching it the way we did. I do have one question for you that I, you may not know the answer to this. And this is going a, a bit of a deep dive again, because we were able to watch that uh, documentary on Earl Owensby, where the man, the bought, myth, the legend, <laughs> he bought a disused or decommissioned nuclear power plant. Oh yes, and that ended up becoming uh, a set for the Abyss, uh, which I think was filmed in 1987, big blockbuster film at the time, cutting edge special effects at the time. But he rented out like these giant tanks mm -hmm. that were filled with water for the movie. I don't know if this is true, but that the ending scene when they're running when he's chasing Loman in the tunnels, because that's very much like a set. Yes. Uh, do you think those were the, uh, were the, 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 maybe the skeletons of this, uh, of this uncompleted nuclear plant? Yeah. It makes sense. Cause the part where he runs in Loman does, it almost looks like it was a overgrown railroad tunnel. Mm -hmm. And then it goes from there to what seems to be very clearly like a sewer, yeah, I had a cold tunnel type set. It doesn't look like one is the other. So if it was part of this uh, underwater nuclear plant that uh, that Earl Owensby bought that James Cameron used for the abyss, I wouldn't be surprised because I would also guess Earl Owensby feels like the kind of guy that he's like, if I'm buying an uncompleted nuclear power plant and I'm going to just shoot a ton of things there. Again, this is where in the group picture with Corman, uh, we spent all this money making a film that takes place in like a, a gothic castle. So guys, you have till Monday to think of another movie we can shoot on this set because either we're taking this apart Monday and we're not getting our money's worth or we're just going to shoot another movie next week. So go think of another film. You have the weekend. I feel like Earl Olinsby would have said, I'm buying the plant and I know I can shoot these things there. That that just feels like that guy. Yeah, that that works for me. We'll, yeah. we'll leave it at that. We'll work. Once again, Earl Olinsby bought... A decommissioned nuclear power. <laughs> oh, man. You got to love this guy. 